I'm, I'm Debbie Luke from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've been doing liturgical sculpture for almost 25 years now. And the title of this work is The Righteous Shall Flourish Like the Palm Tree, Shall Grow Like the Cedar in Lebanon. And I'd like to take you on a little tour of uh, the process and the way that I worked and some of my thoughts on these saints. Well, this, the center of the relief is, of course, Christ. Mary to one side, Joseph to the other, and uh, he is positioned in front of a cedar of Lebanon, which is, uh, there's a quote in one of the Psalms about the cedar of Lebanon being uh, a beautiful, strong, everlasting tree, and that the, uh, the saints, my idea was that the saints would, would flourish like the cedar of Lebanon. I think the verbiage is a little different, but... At any rate, I started with the central panel. That was my first panel, and I let it dictate the, the, the following saints. Now, the saints closest to Jesus are chronological, which is why I have Mary's parents here, Jesus' grandparents, uh, Anna and Joachim, and they're featured with St. Thomas. And I might add that the selection of the saints was was the decision of the people here at the center, the monks here. And so I am I just went with their selection of saints, some of which you'll find out are very common, and others I had never heard of. So we have uh, Anna, Joachim, and Thomas on this first panel. That's the next panel I did after the, the central panel. Then I went to my right, and I depicted uh, Augustine, who is being led by Monica. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of Monica, who prayed for Augustine's uh, soul his entire life. And they're followed by Bridget and Patrick of Ireland. And in my research, I found that Bridget was often featured with a lantern, a light, the light of Christ. And then Patrick, of course, uh, holds the bishop's staff like Augustine does. And from there, I, I wanted to keep in the spirit of time. So I went back, to, I, I kind of went back and forth in my uh, work. And this next panel is uh, the head of the Maronites, St. Maron, here with the Maronite stole. And this couple here is a married couple, St. Isidore and Maria, his wife. And uh, Isidore was a farmer, uh, symbolized by the wheat, of course. And Maria was said to have spent a lot of time in the kitchen because Isidore would bring uh, his fellow workers. He worked in the field. He was a laborer. He would bring his fellow workers in, and, and Maria would always say, well, I don't have enough food. And somehow the bounty just flowed, and she never ran out of food, so I depicted her with her little basket of fruit and vegetables with her spoons. And then I went from there, I went back, I hope this isn't too confusing, <laughs> but I went back and I did this second panel to the right of Christ, which is St. Francis with his familiar bird and Claire holding a monstrance and Anthony of Padua with the Christ child. And uh, the brothers here, the fathers, suggested uh, this story that I had never heard of about the donkey. Uh, it was a, a tale that apparently Anthony of Padua lived at a time when there was uh, the heresy that the Eucharist was not the real body of Christ. And he wanted to dispel that heresy. So the story goes, and you know, it's probably a legend, but it's a sweet story, that he had a donkey and he said he wasn't going to feed the donkey for three days at which time he would place a host and food for the donkey in another bowl, the host in one bowl, the food in another bowl. And sure enough, the donkey knelt in front of the host, the sacred host. And so it's considered the story of the kneeling donkey. So we have the donkey looking up at the monstrance at the host there that Claire is holding. Then I went back <laughs> to this uh, third panel, which is um, Agnes of Prague. A lot of people are familiar with Agnes of Rome, but this is Agnes of Prague, whom I had never heard of. 
and she had, wears the crown because she was royalty. And she could have lived a life of ease and riches and luxury, but she chose to follow Christ. And she had a connection with Claire. In fact, Claire, who had founded her order following St. Francis, Claire was said to have sent five or six of her sisters to minister under the direction of Agnes of Hobb. And she's holding the San, San Damiano crucifix because, of course, her, her inspiration was through Francis and Claire. Um, and then behind her is Lorenzo Ruiz. I didn't know anything about Lorenzo Ruiz. He was a Philippine, the first Philippine saint. And he, he was uh, affected greatly by the Dominican priests who started the rosary, of course, the devotion of the rosary, from what I've learned. And poor Lorenzo, he has a very sad tale. He was falsely accused of a murder. And to escape the punishment, he fled on a boat to Japan with some Dominicans. And unfortunately, when he got in Japan, he realized that they were persecuting the Catholics there. And so he was put to death, not before he was tortured. And so uh, he was also put to death with many companions. So I've suggested, you know, in lower relief, his, his companions there. And of course, the palm branch symbolizes martyrdom in Christian iconography. So he has the palm branch there. From that relief, I went back to uh, our own American saints, Saint Viteri, the Native American, and Saint Elizabeth Ann Seton. Viteri also has kind of a tragic story. She lost her parents to smallpox, and she actually contracted the illness and was terribly scarred for all of her life. And she was ostracized by her own community. And she uh, came under the uh, influence of some Jesuit missionaries. And so she fled her Native American community and went north with the Jesuits. And uh, she, she was said the reason she has the two crosses is she, she loved the woods, she loved nature. And she would walk through the woods and, and fashion little crucifixes out of sticks. And so, uh, and they, you know, line the path where she had walked. So, she died at a very, very young age. Um, but she left her mark in, the, uh, in that area of the country. And then this is Elizabeth Ann Seton, who is considered the mother of Catholic education. She also had a very interesting story. Uh, she was married, had at least four, maybe five children, I forget how many sons and daughters, and she was very well connected in on the East Coast with uh, some wealthy families. She married into a family of, of some wealth, but her husband uh, got sick and they went to Italy because they had a connection in Italy, a business connection, and her husband ended up dying there. Over time, she, while she was in Italy, she became a Catholic. She was from a Protestant family originally. And she became so on fire with the Catholic uh, traditions and faith practices that when she came back to the United States, she converted. And uh, much to the dismay of her Protestant relatives and friends, uh, she converted and eventually, she was very well read, very intelligent. A bishop there sort of drafted her to start a school for young girls. And so she's been featured here with a young girl in each of a rosary. This gesture of hers is, is kind of the most famous portrait of her. If you look up, you know, the first image you'll come across if you Google uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton is, is an image very similar to that. And then from there, I went back to this next panel on the left, or to Christ right. And this is these two saints. This first one here is Andrew Dung Lac, and he is a, a Vietnamese saint. And he too was martyred 
So he has the, the martyr's poem on his shoulder. And he too was martyred with a group, with many, many. In fact, the, the feast day is called St. Andrew Dunlac and Companions. So they're depicted here. And um, the little sculpture there is, uh, I think it's Our, Our Lady of Dunlac. I forget if that's the exact name, but I believe it is. And you'll see this. Most Vietnamese churches in the United States are named after her because she was a vision that came to some of these uh, Vietnamese refugees that, well, they were refugees in their own country. To escape persecution, they went out in the, in the woods. And there was a, I forget whether, it was, it was a type of vine, I think. And yes, and that's why you can see very, very low relief, very subtle. This is the vine that was associated with healing that she told the Vietnamese there to uh, you know, drink tea from these leaves. And uh, at any rate, uh, it might be Jasmine, I'm not sure. But at any rate, that's Andrew Dunlack. And then the next one is Conrad of Parsum. And I didn't know anything about Conrad of Parsum, but he has a lot in common with Solanus Casey because it's said that all he wanted was a quiet life of contemplation and he ended up being the doorkeeper at a very busy monastery. Said sometimes he would open the door 200 times a day for people. But he kept this devotion to Christ and this heart for the poor uh, throughout all his years. And, uh, so from there, I went to the second to last piece on uh, this side. This, of course, is Charbel Makouf. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but another Maronite saint. And Saint Charbel is supposedly responsible for more miracles than any other saint in the whole pantheon of Catholic saints. I'm not sure if that's true, but <laughs> he is certainly, to this day, people pray to him for miracles for healing. And uh, so that's Charbel Makouf. This pair are the, uh, the saints who ministered to the lepers on Molokai. This is Damien of Molokai. And uh, Damien was from maybe Belgium, I'm not sure. But at any rate, he ended up volunteering for this faraway mission to care for, you know, the most outcast members of society uh, who were banished to Molokai from the main island, Oahu, and other Hawaiian islands because they were considered untouchables. And Damien devoted his life. He worked very hard. He had very strong hands. There's a pic, there's an actual photograph of Damien that uh, shows his, his left hand. It's very strong, and it's obviously a hand that has worked hard. So I wanted to depict that. And then when Damien got sick, this is Marianne Cope, and she came from the East Coast too, and she volunteered to go work with the lepers in Hawaii. And I didn't, I hadn't known much about uh, Marianne, but at any rate, she was ahead of her time in that Damien contracted leprosy and died of the disease. She was insistent with all of her sisters on hand washing, and so she would. Uh, she never contracted the disease, and none of her sisters ever contracted the disease. I thought that was really, really interesting. Then we go back to the final relief on the left, which is three, three saints who are, uh, of course, <laughs> Solanus Casey. These are the most recent in time, of course. And the first one you see is Andre Bissette, who was from Canada, I believe, and he had a devotion to St. Joseph, so he's holding the St. Joseph statue. He, uh, kind of like Solanus Casey, didn't have a great deal of uh, academic prowess, and so he, uh, he kind of wasn't considered uh, for the priesthood because he had trouble mastering the academics. And, uh, but he became uh, kind of kind of like Solanus Casey in his community. He became well known for his holiness, uh, and people sought him out for miracles and healing. And so he was And this here, this is kind of an obvious saint here with the KFC. 
I had never heard of Michael McGivney, but at any rate, this is Michael McGivney who founded the Knights of Columbus. There are photographs. You know, there were no photographs of the early saints. I had to go by, by the depictions of them by other artists. But in the case of these more recent saints, uh, I had a lot of lot more material to go by. But and then of course the final saint is uh, Solanus Casey, and I wanted to depict him in that popular picture of him where he's holding the Bible. So that's that's the last. Last but not least, certainly on this side. And then on the right, on the far right, we have two saints with whom I was uh, familiar, of course, Pope John the 23rd who was the Pope when I was a child and started Vatican II. And he has that papal stole. And then uh, Harlow Acutis, who is very familiar. There are lots of pictures of him because he's our, our 21st century saint. And uh, he, he's a young man who had a profound devotion to the Eucharist. And he documented Eucharistic miracles all over the world. And so he has, he had, uh, I wanted to depict him with the monstrance. And uh, he also, one story I read about him said that he protected children who were being bullied. And so I wanted to add a child. And I like the fact that there's, there's a little girl and a little boy in this composition of otherwise adult saints. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the story. I remember the quote now about the cedar of Lebanon. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. So that's why I chose that image for this, for this relief. I like to think that the saints never die, obviously. We're still talking about them, remembering them, and uh, praying to them and with them. So that's the story of these panels.